Good morning, and may it please the Court, I'm Assistant Attorney General Ken Salinger for the Commissioner of Revenue. In this case, Mr. Duart was given ample warning that his per-pack cigarette prices were below the presumptive minimum allowed by law. He was first warned on June 9th of 2003. He was warned again on October 15th and 17th. It was not until October 27th that the Commissioner gave notice of an intent to suspend the license for five days. So Mr. Duart had four and a half months to avoid a sanction by doing one of three things. Um, the, the, are there regulations that prescribe how the taxpayer defends an enforcement action? There are regulations that de <coughs> define um, what a seller can do to um, prove a compliance with the statute, yes. But who has the burden in these proceedings? Uh, Your Honor, the legislature has um, specified that the Commissioner of Revenue may rely on the statutory presumptions of what the costs are. And in the absence of proof to the contrary by, in this case, the retailer, it is those cost presumptions that govern. And so it, when... Do you think there's any ambiguity in that provision of the statute? And I'm, I think it's... You're not going to have to help me what the section is. It's uh, paragraphs B and C of section 13. 13 or 14? It, it's 14 that 14 requires... <coughs> It is 14 that imposes the obligation not to sell below cost. It's 13 B and C that create the presumptions of what the okay. costs are in the absence in of contrary proof. Of, which I'm now looking for, of, of the section, suggests maybe there's a little ambiguity as to whose burden. But I mean, I, I think I read it as you do, but is that the issue in this case, whose burden? It wasn't the issue as the case was tried, Your Honor. As the case was tried, Mr. Duart conceded that he was selling cigarettes no, below the lawful that, but, but price. Whose burden? Under the statute, and therefore the regulations are clear that it's the, because you have to you have to affirmatively petition. I understand that, but if the statute means that it's his burden, then there's less problem. It seems to me with the regulation than if the statute is suggesting that when the commissioner brings an enforcement action, the commissioner has to prove that it was it was. Um, he was selling under cost, and that seems to be, I could be wrong, the position the taxpayer is taking here. Your Honor, this, this Court held in Ryan that the Commissioner does not have to prove a sale below actual cost. I don't know. Ryan was about 50, 60 years ago. Um, and, and was it talking in, the, in this context precisely? It was talking in the context of, of the question of actual cost versus presumed cost. This was the key error by the Appellate Tax Board. The Appellate Tax Board said the Commissioner had a burden to prove sales below actual cost. As a matter of law, that's error. The statute is clear. Why? In, Why? Because the statute is clear part of the statute. in paragraphs B and C of section 13 yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, the that the cost to the, uh, the language, Your Honor, um, is that the statutory presumptions regarding cost apply, quote, in the absence of proof of a lesser or higher cost of doing business by the retailer making the sale, close, close quote. Paragraph B of section 13. Well, it then goes on. And so, Your Honor, the, the statutory scheme is it's illegal for a retailer to sell at less than cost to the retailer. That's the term used by the statute. The statute makes clear in paragraph B of section 13 that cost to the retailer either means actual cost or the statutory presumptions. The legislature recognized that the commissioner needs a practical way to enforce this statute. Well, all is it clear that in this case um, the cost of doing business by the retail retailer was 25 percent of the invoice cost? That was the the presumption that underlies the list of presumptive prices calculated by the commissioner. There was never any evidence proffered by Mr. Duart that his uh, overhead cost was different from that. He d also did not ever proffer his, his invoices. If his invoices had been lower than the statutory presumptions suggest they would be when you work through the presumptions the regarding wholesale the statu costs. The statutory presumption? For the wholesale. Your Honor, there, there are two levels it's the, of... It's the commissioner who is deciding what the invoice should be, correct? Not the statute. No, but it's from a the, list. Your Honor, the, the commissioner starts with the list price that the commissioner understands right. to be constant for all wholesale purchasers. Right. And then simply mirrors the statutory presumption. But the invoice you're talking about is the invoice for the retailer's purchase of cigarettes, right? 
Right. My point, Your Honor. So that's not a statutory presumption. That's a fact. And the commissioner under the regulation goes out and says, this is what I establish is the invoice price. Almost, Your Honor. The commissioner states publicly what the commissioner, in following the statutory presumptions, believes is that the — In following this, what statutory presumption exists with respect to the invoice price that a retailer pays for his cigarettes? It's implicit, Your Honor, because the statute starts with the price paid by the wholesaler, adds the cost of the wholesaler to come up with a total cost of the wholesaler, adds a 25 percent presumed overhead to the retailer to come up with the total cost of the retailer. That's nothing to do with the invoice, but go ahead. This is — this is — And so the result of the statutory calculation of the cost to the wholesaler should be, in the absence of evidence to the contrary, the invoice price to the retailer. So the point I was trying to make, Your Honor, is if, in fact, Mr. Duart had been paying very low invoice prices, and if taking his invoice price and adding 25 percent to it, that statutory presumption for the retailer, produced a result that was less than the presumptive minima calculated by the commissioner, it would have been very easy for Mr. Duart to show that. He made no attempt to. I — I don't know what happened, but at least on the second inspection, your tax examiner just looks at — it doesn't make any inquiry, and that's a question why who's got the burden is important. He just sees the cigarette price that Mr. Duarte is advertising. He says it's below the state minimum prices, and you've got to remove the signs. Just like that. Boom. Your Honor, under the regulations, then, if Mr. Duart could actually show that his actual costs were less than the presumed cost — He didn't ask. I'm sorry? He didn't ask. He — No, not — He put an inspector at a store, and Mr. Duarte says, you know, these are my competitors, BJ's Wholesale. This is within the law, and by the way, I've talked to my lawyer, and your inspector doesn't say, well, show me the invoices. Not there in the field. Of course not, Your Honor. As a practical — But then there's a formal proceeding that follows that. Exactly, Your Honor. Well, I have a question about the proceeding. Is there anything in the regulations that says how current his competitor's prices must be? In other words, when he showed the evidence for November, is that good enough for October? It's not good enough, Your Honor, not because the regulations speak to it, but because the statutory language says the safe harbor only applies if Mr. Duart was setting prices to meet prices of his competitor. You can't be meeting prices of a competitor that haven't happened yet. But how can he get — how would he have the invoices from his competitors, say, for August and September until he knows he's going to be charged, and he doesn't know he's charged until October? Well, he knew in June. He was given warning in June. That's my point about the four and a half months. If what Mr. Duart was doing was responding to lawful prices of competitors for the same articles, he had plenty of time to go out and gather that information. He made no attempt to do so until after he was given notice that his license would be suspended. So the manner in which the Commissioner enforced the law and the regulations was quite fair in this case. Mr. Duart had four and a half months to either prove he was acting lawfully or bring himself into compliance. Going back to — But I take it your — a retailer would also be well advised, even before receiving notification from any of the investigators, that if he's going to go below the invoice price plus the 25 percent, if he's going to go below that, he should go out and start collecting information immediately as to what the competitors are doing. Absolutely. If he's going to go below it and he's got a lawful basis for doing so. If he's going to go below it and he's trying to break the law, the reason why the legislature has — He's not intentionally breaking the law. He doesn't think he's breaking the law. He, among other things, is relying on Section 16 that says any retailer or wholesaler may advertise off of the sale menu, or Section 16 says. And so he — I mean, you're asking every cigarette salesperson to keep, you know, current of whatever competitors are doing just in case the State decides to target them? If I may start with the question of intent, Your Honor, the legislature has specified in paragraph B of Section 14 that proof of sales at less than cost to the retailer shall be prima facie evidence of intent to injure competitors. That's not conclusive. That's prima facie. That's correct. And so here's what the ATB found. It found that Mr. Duart, in good faith, acted to meet the prices of the competition as permitted by the statute. Doesn't that end this case? No, Your Honor, because there's not one shred of evidence to support that. The only thing they pointed to was competitors' prices — Did he testify that he did that to meet the competition? No, Your Honor. As we show in the brief, what he testified to is that it wasn't until November of 2003 and into 2004 — That's precisely the problem. He doesn't think he's doing anything wrong. He could have kept, maybe, from June onward. He doesn't know that he's got to start keeping from June onward. It's 
some man shows up his door and says, I'm from the commissioner, you've got to take those signs down. He says, let me tell you what the competitors are doing. You've got to take them down. Why is that notice that he's going to get charged? He doesn't get, the, he doesn't get notice for a hearing until after that. And he doesn't have to. In the meantime, he can do whatever he wants, right? And in fact, he always, in this case, because of the ATV, he's never had to change his prices. Actually. His license was never suspended. He, there's evidence in the record that by 2004, he did increase his prices to lawful levels, which, um, although this is not in the record, as a general matter, um, when the Department of Revenue gives notice that somebody's violating the law, typically the retailer comes into compliance. Mr. Duart didn't. That's why this is the unusual case of, of this sanction. Uh, well, the, The legislature has deemed it to be very important that retailers and wholesalers do not sell cigarettes at below cost prices. Back when the statute was passed in 1945, they stated in Section 12 of the statute um, that they were focusing on the need to increase and stabilize tax, uh, cigarette prices so that tax revenues would be stabilized and increased. Of course, today there's a very important public health reason to make sure that cigarettes are not sold at below cost prices. The public health reason Your Honor, the Commissioner did not fix prices here either. That was another error by the Appellate Tax Board. The regulations specify that a seller may present evidence and show that, quote, their actual cost is lower than the applicable presumptive cost, close quote. Mr. Duart had the opportunity to make that showing here. He made no effort to make it, presumably because he couldn't. And so this notion of our prices being fixed by the Commissioner is a red herring. What the Commissioner has done by regulation and in this price list is closely reflect, closely mirror the presumptive minimum costs that are established by the legislature by statute. The le legislature has set up that scheme so that the statute would be enforceable. The statute may well be unenforceable if the commissioner, in order to prove a violation, had to go out and collect the actual invoices that each retailer paid and actually go out and affirmatively prove each retailer's overhead costs. Did you, did you say Mr. Duart should have got the invoices from BJ's and the other retailers? No, Your Honor. What I said was that his own invoices for what he paid when he bought cigarettes, which by law he's required to keep, he could easily have been produced if he paid such a low price that adding 25 percent to that would bring him under the statutory presumption. Um, the argument right. you've just given, is that your, how you rebut the um, language in the Ryan case that the um, commissioner cannot set prices, cannot fix prices? The argument you've just given. Um, the argument that I just gave, Your Honor, saying that the regulation allows right. proof of actual cost directly rebuts the notion that the commissioner is fixing prices. So good, because in Ryan it says, Chapter 64C, doesn't give authority to the commissioner to fix prices for cigarettes. And you're, this is how you... That's right. This, that. this, this scheme was set up specifically to comply with Ryan. Ryan goes on, of course, specifically to hold that the, the, what is now the appellate tax board, and therefore, of course, the commissioner can rely on the presumptions. May, may I ask you a, a kind of a general big picture question? Is, is it your position, then, that a store owner uh, cannot reduce their prices to compete with someone else who has lower prices and just keep to... to uh, keep up with the competition, keep lowering their prices. There's a point at which they can't, can't do that. They can't, they can only do that if the competitor's prices are lawful. There's, there's a quite specific language in section 16 of the <coughs> statute that says a seller can, can uh, in good faith, meet the prices of a competitor who is selling the same article at cost to him. 
Here, Mr. Duart was not meeting the prices of competitors because those prices happen after the fact. Um, he wasn't selling the same article as BJ's, for example, because cartons of cigarettes are not the same article as packs of cigarettes. And there, there was not evidence that the uh, other retailers were selling at cost to them. Again, just as the commissioner by law can rely on the statutory presumptions to figure out what Mr. Duart's costs are, the commissioner can rely on those presumptions to figure out what all the retailers' costs are. Uh, may I? Um, on another, you make another argument that the ATB does not have authority to invalidate the regulation. Yes, Your Honor. Well, wouldn't it be foolish for the ATB to decide 30 cases under this regulation rather than to just, wouldn't it be more sensible to just declare it invalid instead yeah. of going it, on and acting under it in every case saying the same thing? It, it feels like a, a fine point, but it's a, an important legal point, Your Honor. Um, if, if the board said that, look, you, you can't ever apply, uh, apply this regulation legally, legally, and so therefore we reverse in this case, and if the commissioner didn't appeal or appealed in loss, and this court said the regulation can never be applied in any course, case, of course the commissioner is going to follow that and be bound by that. Um, but the appellate tax board um, is, is a creature of limited jurisdiction. It can decide the cases before it. Um, it can't reach out and, and decide big due process issues that, in this case, in fact, had, had no relevance. Mr. Duart's license was never suspended. He certainly could not have suffered a violation of due process. Well, quite the contrary. This might have. And they suggest the following. As I understand it, Mr. Clerk, your uh, tax department has to have an cigarette smoke, selling tobacco, not illegal to do that, consults with his lawyer, and the commissioner just targets him. And now the commissioner says, well, in the past, we sent you a notice and then you bring it up again. And he says, no, I've got some rights here, some due process rights. Why shouldn't we be concerned about uh, you know, footnote six in the ATB's <coughs> Uh, because of footnote 8 in the ATB's decision, the ATB held that there is, quote, no indication that DOR acted out of any invidious or similarly impermissive motive, close quote. So there was no unlawful. It may not be invidious. It may not be invidious. But, if, but if in essence, a tax examiner can show up and with, with nothing more essentially cause the retailer to act in a way that may not be your Honor, this court rejected a very similar argument in the beneficial finance case when the Commonwealth's Deputy Commissioner of Banks was charged with criminal bribery and he said, I'm not the only one, I shouldn't be singled out, that's no, just I'm wrong. Not about, I'm not talking about that, I'm just talking about <clears throat> how you challenge it. If the, if the Commissioner just defers that you go ahead and comply as soon as somebody shows up with the 25 with the 20, you know, whatever, presumes the presumptive prices. As a practical matter, Your Honor, how could Mr. Duart have challenged it here if after he was put on notice in June he had evidence either that he was meeting lawful prices of a competitor, all the elements of Section 16, um, or if he could show that his actual costs meant that he could sell for less than that. He had time to come forward and say to the commissioner, wait, what I'm doing is lawful. But he did not do that, Your Honor. So he had four and a half months where he could have avoided sanction by coming forward with any kind of evidence. Yes, a two-part answer, Your Honor. The regulations say that clearly. And secondly, we submit that the commissioner did not create this burden out of whole cloth, but it's consistent with what the legislature said in Section 13, uh, when, again, the legislature said that in the absence of proof um, by the retailer or wholesaler of lower costs, then the statutory presumptive costs that's, apply. That's all. I don't want your way over your time, but that's always true in tax enforcement. I mean, you go to the taxpayer and you say, hey, in the Internal Revenue you got this deduction. Show us the proof. 
Absolutely, Your Honor. This is the same thing, isn't it? The, the general rule is the burden of proof is on the tax. Us, right. That's right. Burden of proof is on the taxpayer. This is not a tax case, but we say this is part of the tax statutes. Correct. And, and the same basic <clears throat> scheme applies. I know you're way over your time limit. I've been trying to ask this question, and I will get to it. Um, <laughs> Mr. Duart, according to you, violated Section 14, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Which says it's unlawful for a retailer with intent to injure competitors, destroy substantially or lessen competition to advertise, offer, or sell retail cigarettes at less than cost, right? Yes. You say, it, well, if, if the, the statute says if you sell below uh, a certain set formula for pricing, there is a prima facie case. Correct. Yeah. As I say, prima facie is not conclusive. It's simply a prima facie case. Where in your <laughs> hearing process does the retailer get to say no? I am complying with the statute because I am not selling below cost in order to injure competitors or destroy competition. I'm selling at whatever I'm selling at to meet competition. Where does he get to make that claim? Your Honor, there is a, a catch-all provision. I don't have the site at my fingertips. It's in the brief. The regulations provide an opportunity for the uh, seller to, to proffer any evidence that shows that they're in compliance with the statute. That's a paraphrase. That's I'm reading the scope of your the scope of your pre-approval hearing, which doesn't permit this to be uh, an issue, and the scope of your suspension hearing, which also doesn't permit this to be an issue. And I'm wondering where does the person defend, as the statute says they should be able to? I, I do apologize for, uh, if I may follow up with a letter just to provide the site to the to the regulation. There is a provision in the regulation that clearly allows the seller to proffer whatever evidence they may have. So to that show like compliance with Section 16 in, in this four, 14. And, and the manner, as, as the record shows, the manner in which the commissioner actually enforces the, the regulation is to give people an opportunity to come into compliance either by raising their prices or by coming forward with <laughs> evidence that they've acted lawfully. Mr. Duart did none of those things during the four and a half months before his uh, license, what he got notice of a suspension, as we show in our brief, um, it is completely consistent with due process, given the important governmental interests at stake here for the commissioner to require if, if that. If it was so important, how come there was not a single additional enforcement action in that community when the evidence seems to be overwhelming that everyone is violating the law down there? If I may, Your Honor, the record does not show that there was not any other enforcement action. What the record shows is that the commissioner, under an obligation of confidentiality, wouldn't not disclose able to... any other enforcement. Exactly, Your Honor. All right. Well, the record shows that there was no other enforcement action. Uh, I, I, I'll stick with my answer to, to Justice Cordy. I don't believe that's what the record shows. The record shows that Mr. Duart complained that many others were selling at unlawful prices, but there is no evidence in the record showing that the commissioner failed to enforce elsewhere. Um, in any case, um, if I may just close briefly and point back to beneficial finance, this court has made clear that it's, it's completely appropriate in uh, a circumstance where government has limited resources to target a, a, an obvious offender, make an example out of them, and in that way show to others they too must follow the law. What happened here was proper. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Phillips. Good morning, Your Honors. Colin Phillips on behalf of Mr. Duart. Now, Your Honor, there's, there's so, a little bit disingenuous in some of those arguments. The, how the proceeding, if you look at the genesis of this, the suspension order said that there were only two issues that could be held at, or discussed at the hearing. One is whether they applied for the exemption. <coughs> two, whether or not they had to prove in the negative whether they had throughout the process. So the arguments that they made regarding Section 16 they put in there, the, uh, excuse me, the, the DOR had argued that the regulation, the scope of that regulation doesn't even allow those arguments. That's how the regulation drastically changes the structure of the statute and supplants the burden 
under the statute. If you look at it, it wasn't clear to me when I read that, and we can all read it and make our own judgment, that the burden. Who's burden do you think it is under Section 13B? I believe it's on the commissioner. And I think. In that language? You, don't, you think, in other words, that the. In, uh, I'm sorry, you're on a Section 16 or 13? 13B. I believe if one, it's, it's not clear, and two, it's on the commissioner. And if you take a look at the record here, there's one thing that's true, and you can see from this record, is that the statute was working fine in New Bedford. The statute designed to weed out any anti-competitive behavior. There was no problem. There was good competition in New, in New Bedford. The record's replete with that. I mean, he, even after he was um, told to bring his prices up, he had people coming into his store saying, why are your prices higher than the next store? Why are your prices higher? There is good competition there. There was never an issue of Mr. Dua doing anything anti-competitive or doing anything to injure his competitors. And the decision showed that he didn't even have the market power to do that. He couldn't do that. But there is a statute, there is this prima facie case, though, if you're selling below the, the price, right? That, that there will be yes, uh, the intent to injure your competitors is going to be presumed. Correct. Right? Yes, Your Honor, that is, in the, that is in the statute. However, if you look... I suppose your answer is, but I can tell you that my competitors are selling even less. I'm sorry, Your Honor, to hear the beginning. That my, and the answer from the retailer is that my competitors are selling them for even less. And, and you need some yes, evidence Your Honor. of that. And that brings in Section 16, which is the defensive pricing, which the ATB hit on. Now, and there was well, some discussion... You weren't, you weren't prevented from producing evidence that competitors were selling product at less than you were, were you? Uh, competitors were selling product less. No, they, they presented that evidence. He had, yeah. But they, they, did they present it at the ATB, or were they permitted to present it before the commissioner in the, in the suspension hearing? It was presented at the ATB. Mm -hmm. The suspension hearing was limited to those two issues. Whether there's an exemption, look close to right. at the list. That was one of the problems that troubled the ATB, is that the pre suspension hearing, if you limit it, you can't do that. You can't can, introduce that. Can you get in discovery um, anything of oh, the third party? Can you get any? Is there any way for you to get um, October's prices or September's prices from BJ? No, Your Honor, and we would have put it out, I think, in our brief. The only way practically to do that is to subpoena all the 31 or 51 retailers and get their records and ask what their costs are and determine what they are actually doing to defend, you know, but under you, that but section. But you said you did it to compete with BJ, so it wasn't 31 or 51. It was one specific well, on the, oh. issue, on the issue of price, you can look at their yeah. prices, correct, and you could... So you could have presented pr their prices in September and October? Uh, I think the evidence, if you look at the record, was too. There was oral evidence that this gentleman, Mr. Duart, had canvassed his, his, the local retail... Well, I know, but that's different from presenting hard evidence of what their prices were in September and October. I, I agree that it's different than a receipt, but it is circumstantial yeah. evidence as a businessman I understand, of the, of the I prices. I understand, but it's one thing you can disbelieve him, but if you... And, put in a document showing the price, you can still disbelieve it, but it's a lot higher. Yes. But, but I take it the ATB, in fact, as I read their findings, they said they, they, there was a hearing before the ATB, right? It was yes. a real hearing, real evidence. Yes, there are. And yes, they sir. found that your client in good faith acted to meet the prices of the competition as permitted by the statute. I don't think there was any evidence before the ATB, and I don't think the uh, Commonwealth could even argue there was any evidence that he intended to injure uh, competition, and he did anything but try to operate in good faith to meet his competitors so he wouldn't go out of business. Do you dispute that someone has to determine factually what the cost is and the discounts, et cetera, that that has to be set by somebody? Determine the cost? The cost, and, and to, the, to, the, to everybody, the cost and the discounts. I, what I'm saying is, doesn't, don't, don't you agree, someone has to establish the rate, the proper rate that should be, at which cigarettes should be under, sold. Under Section 13A, the, and cost the, <coughs> the cost to the retailer, you start with the cost to the retailer. Yes. And somebody has to set that and then, and then determine if there are discounts and things like that. How do you say that should be done? Who, who should do it? Well, because you're here you're saying the commissioner is fixing prices. Correct. By, by, by the list that he established. Well, how do you say these rates should be set? Well, I, I don't think the commissioner has the authority to set the rates. That's the issue. Well, so it's not asked, there in the statute. So what happens to this? So I'm saying, what do you do then? I'm asking you that. What? what how, how is the statute complied with? Well, the, the, instead of putting the burden on the retailers to do all the policing and what have you, the DOR under the statute has the obligation to police. They know if they go around whose prices are different. It's not as if without a price list you don't have a, a, a number or you so know. You're saying there should not be a price list. There, there should not be a set price. And any discussion or any... Section 12. This is 
Yes, Your Honor. Um, and it says, you're not allowed to sell lost leaders. You and I know what a lost leader is. But you're not allowed to sell a lost leader with a particular purpose in mind, and that is the intent to injure competitors or to destroy competition, right? Yes. And then he's got to enforce them. Now, one way you don't have a lost leader is you've got to set the cost to the retailer. Right? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. So, you know, BJ's or other retailer says, these are my costs. These are my costs. I, my costs are um, $2, uh, and therefore I can't sell a pack. It's been a long time for <coughs> $2, but you know, $1.75. I've got to sell them either at cost or above. No loss leaders. Yes. And so BJ sells them at $2.25. Your client, because he doesn't have all the things that BJ's has available, volume and so on and so forth, his cost is two dollars and fifty cents. Right? Yes, sure. So he can't sell at two dollars and twenty-five cents just because BJ does, can he? Unless he, uh, he unless he uh, falls within the section sixteen safe harbor. And so. I don't believe so. I believe that's his second position. I believe the regulations are, uh, there's no authority to enact the regulations which fix the prices and that the statute, as it's been working for years and years and years, is just fine. I mean, this is the only enforcement action we've ever seen under this regulation, ever. Well, how long have, if you know, how long have, have the commissioner had regulations setting um, <coughs> with the, the lists of invoice prices? I've seen different dates. I thought it was the late 1980s. I, I believe. I saw the date in the briefs. I started to mention somewhere, but it's been a long time. These regulations went into effect 1989. I think that's right. The late 1980s is my best of my memory. And so this is the only enforcement action. So the statute was working fine. The market forces were working fine. If there was someone out of line in selling as a lost leader, the competitors would, I assume, file a complaint as they had a complaint procedure. They would go see that retailer, and then they would start the activity of proving whether they're selling under cost. Rather than presuming and shifting the burden that they walk in the store with a list they've never seen, we haven't touched the issue of the list isn't posted. It is, excuse me, posted on the, on the website. It's not given to the retailers. It's not, it's not clear to me that, that Section 13D provides for that, and I, and I may agree with you. In other words, in the absence of proof of a lesser or higher cost of doing business, the cost of doing business shall be presumed to be 25 percent of the invoice cost. Of the, all that that says to me, at least as I read it initially. Was, it's very difficult to prove the cost of doing business. It is very, very difficult. So what you're trying to do is stop lost leaders. You've got an invoice. How much did I pay the third-party seller, the wholesaler who gave me the cigarettes? And if I can't be bothered to, if I can't, I, the retailer, can't be bothered to figure out what my costs are, I, the legislature said you can afford <coughs> not 25% of the cost of the invoice. Uh, I, I, yes, I believe so, Your Honor, and that's in, that would come into play when there's a, an enforcement proceeding, a proper enforcement proceeding under the statute where, where, like I said, the market forces have directed that someone's a lost leader and either get complaints or it comes to the knowledge of the DOR, and then they proceed against that person, and then it triggers the statute, and then they produce their evidence. And then at that hearing, you say, your client comes in and says, here are my invoices, Yes. And lost leader, yes. Here are my invoices, and I'm not going to be bothered to prove the overhead costs. And so I'm going to I'm going to go with Section 13B, and it's 25 percent. They could how, they how could you, potentially be an argument they could use, yes, or they could go with the actual iron accountant, go with the actual cost, why and come in. Why they do that here? Leaving aside whether or not, for whatever reason, maybe the commissioner hadn't printed prices, right? Yes. Maybe the uh, tax examiner said, "I've got a complaint." Yes. So have to tell me, somebody thinks that, that you're violating Section 13, Section 12. Yes. Why couldn't your client have done that? And, and it's an interesting question, Your Honor. And, and I looked through the record for a testimony on the actual cost issue. It never was an issue. 
that was brought up in the preliminary suspension hearings it is not an issue you can discuss under that regulation. But, but it wasn't an issue because you never sought prior written approval for <coughs> to present this kind of evidence. Isn't that isn't that the reason? No, Your Honor. The 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 exact you have to. You, you have the opportunity to present the kind of evidence that the Chief Justice is talking about if you want to present it, and you can seek the written approval of the commissioner to 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 sell at a lower rate. If they had, yes, and shifting and, and that the burden. Wasn't done here. Shift, it shift, correct. Shifting the burden away from the retail, excuse me, away from the commission and putting it on the retail to hire an accountant, hire a lawyer, go through the entire process, and then maybe end up here at that great expense. But that's why the issues are limited at the, at the, pre, at the suspension hearing before the commissioner, because the, the, the vendor in this case chose not to avail himself of the opportunity to hire an accountant and go through all, all no, those numbers. Well, I, I, don't th I think the letter from the uh, DOR to him is fairly clear. The only two issues this, the regulation allows is whether you applied the exemption and whether you sold or offered for sale. But, but, but the reason for that, I think, it, tell me if I'm wrong, the reason why they're limited in that way is because you did not avail yourself of the opportunity to present the specific evidence for a lower rate. You, you, for, for prior approval. You mean way prior to the suspension? Yeah. You yes. didn't avail yourself of, of the, the regulation? Office. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, that would be, certainly be one of them. There's only been one. That, that's why there's never been limited. I understand, but there's never been anyone in the entire Commonwealth who has ever sought that exemption for PACs. And the only, only person who's ever done it wholesale-wise is BJ's, who but, has but, the market but, and but the from, money to do that, a small businessman. But from a due process. Behind from, the eight ball. Okay, but from a due process analysis, you do have the opportunity to present the numbers, if you want to, and obtain prior written approval to sell at, a, at below presumptive rates. Uh, I, it is one step in the process, but I don't think it satisfies your due process to do that. Can I ask you a somewhat related question? It, it, assume that you shouldn't have to do that, and the statute says that the cost to the retailer is the invoice cost of cigarettes to the retailer, and you say the commission has no authority to set a list, a list of what those are. Yes. How is it? How can the commissioner even bring an enforcement action? I mean, he doesn't, or she, uh, doesn't have... Um, I mean, you're the one that's got the evidence of what your costs are. I mean, I don't understand how you would, how this statute could be enforceable if you don't have the commissioner making some stab at setting uh, th those, those costs to the retailers. Your Honor, I don't think it's any mystery to the um, investigators for the DOR, without a price-fixing schedule that they had, what the costs were or what the average cost then as they go to these facilities all the time and, and conduct inventory audits and check on the tax stamps all the time. I, I believe the, the knowledge within the DOR, uh, they have the ability to determine or know within a small range what the prices of cigarettes are wholesale uh, or wholesale and retail. So I think if someone's selling at a lost leader, it is going to be a red flag like that. And also the competitors, if someone's selling at a loss leader, are probably going to file a complaint. So under the existing statute, it was working fine. Yes, sir, I yes. have a different concern, which is what, not how can they go, maybe they can't go about it without setting a price, but what's, what's the, uh, the Department of Revenue's basis for setting the price? Because it seems to me that they have tacked on, in other words, how do they set the prices? If 13... Yes. Are the invoice costs to all retailers the same? I, I'm not, I can't answer that question. I'm not sure if it's in the record, Your Honor. In other words, does BJ's pay the same price? Does BJ's pay the same price as a one-store smoke shop? Yeah, I, I would imagine no, Your Honor, since BJ's did apply for an exemption. Uh, and the market forces would dictate that a large conglomerate like BJ's could get a better price from... I just from don't know whether Philip Morris, when it, well, whoever the wholesaler is that sells to retailers has basically, maybe somebody can tell me, but if, if there's not a set invoice price to 
absolutely every retail seller of cigarettes. I can't see how the commissioner can figure out what the court invoice price is. Your Honor, I, I, I think market would dictate that it, it couldn't be, I mean, because BJ's would have more leverage. But it, the record, I don't have a site in the record, Your Honor, it is not contained in the record. Doesn't, doesn't the commissioner contact all the manufacturers and, and get the prices they charge to, they, they charge regularly in Massachusetts on a monthly basis or on a periodic basis? And isn't that the, the basis for, for the, the calculation that he makes? Your Honor, he posts I, it? I can't answer what the commissioner did, and we were offered very little, if any, discovery in this case. Are the cigarette prices stable from month to month, or do they fluctuate a lot? Stable on the, uh, from, from the point of the DOR's price list or from the point of the actual retailers? What retailers? Uh, what their wholesale prices. What, what their wholesale buying, prices what they're paying. I'm not positive on that. I don't know if it's, it's in the record. All right. One other thing is how did you mention a few times that, that Duarte lost $350,000 um, of revenue. And how did that come about, from having to raise his price? Correct. Okay. I'm losing competition. One last question. Go back to the BJ's example. BJ's costs are $2. They sell at 2 and a quarter. Your costs are $2.50. Can you sell at $2 and a quarter under, under section, the statute? Under Section 16, we believe we can. So you can sell below your cost? Under to meet the cost of competitors. Okay. Thank you.